Time for some Type 40, extra Type 40 video exclusive content here with me, Dan Hadley, Birmingham's King of the Geeks. Welcome back to the channel. Type 40 Extra is our after show, but it's also a before show and an in-between show too. Scrolling the view screen for the sights and sounds of the Hooniverse and those not-so-fixed talking points. Who's calling this time? Who's calling? Who's calling? Well, it's several friends of of the show, I'm happy to say. First of all, we have, who forgot? Yes, so to my left and your right, that's Chris McKeon there, the uh, continuity continuity machine, I <laughs> think. Uh, audio impresario, I think I've described you as before, haven't I, Chris? Otherwise known as the master of Black Glove Studio. Welcome back, Chris. Well, thank you so much for having me again. Secondly, I've got another friend of the show. We've got Lee, a.k.a. Audrid Audiovisual, the man behind the greatest theme tune in the whole of <laughs> Doctor Who podcasting. Stop <laughs> laughing because you know Anybody who tries, you can't argue for a moment, Lee. Happy to have you back on the show. So I've got you two here. I've got Sean Hughes here as well, who I don't know, never spoken to this, this man before, but you're an, you're an actor aren't you, Sean? That's your role in the thing we're going to talk about today without, without spoiling it. Welcome to Type I am. I am, yes. Hello, Dan. Thank you for having me. So we've got an idea. actor. We've got a, a, a general creative genius, an audio <laughs> expert, and we have a seasoned writer and producer of several fan projects and, and proper novels here. What could have possibly have brought them all together for this edition of Type 40? Well, this quite an ominous set of graphics. Does this does this help in any way? Well, it didn't help me, I have to be honest, Lee, until I looked in the dead centre and, and recognised one particular element from the dim and distant black and white past of Doctor Who. So this is something that's gone along with a teaser that you've put out for a brand new audio production, isn't it, that you're all involved in from Black Glove Studio. This is the misshapen planet. Very excited to see it finally appear because you've been telling me about it, all of you, for quite some time. So we've hmm. got this, this fabulous artwork, episode one, The Silent Signal by Chris McKeon, a full cast audio drama starring, oh, Sean Hughes. There's another piece of the puzzle falls into place along with other, other actors there. We'll talk about them in a moment or two as well and uh, and you, your part in this lee is that all the audio work the creation of it is all down to you isn't it so this this is the culmination of lots of different talents to bring a brand new doctor who story to life for the ears isn't it where on earth do we start i mean from my point of view i didn't introduce even though i've known both chris and lee for quite some time sean i didn't introduce you two guys did i so how did you find one another in the end well, um, I think, uh, it, well, it was through Chris first, and yet, so it, it, I've known Chris for about three years, is it now? Yes. Oh, definitely, yeah. yes. Yeah. 2020. And, um, yeah, they, he very kindly asked me to play the part of the first Doctor, which was mind-boggling to say the least. And was there a, an audition process? Did he put you through your, pre your paces there, Sean? No, Did he get you no. to recite? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, um, no. No question about it. <laughs> it's it's something I'm, you know, always working on and um, want to do justice like any fan would. And hopefully I, I have and will do. So I'm glad, I hope people enjoy it. Playing the uh, Doctor. So, have you done any other audio drama in the past? Have you done any other acting? Or was this a completely new thing to you? Um, well, I've been part of a drama group for about since 2017, um, a theatre group in um, my city. And we, we just put on amateur plays. I've been in Julius Caesar, As You Like It, and um, they were really good. Uh, other audio work I've done, I've worked for YouTubers. So I've been uh, j jumping about fan projects. So you're quite actively involved in the Doctor Who fandom as well, then you're uh, clearly a big fan. Yes, yes. Um, I probably started with the show, probably discovered it in the early 2000s on the uh, Doctor Who omnibuses on UK Gold. This goes to show the enduring power of, of this series and particularly the earlier incarnations 
of it, Chris, because obviously a lot of your projects in the past have um, fixated, haven't you? You've fixed on little little holes in the classic series mm -hmm. where there's lots of lots of elbow, elbow room for you to play as a storyteller, haven't you? Th these are the things that appeal to you, the mischievous side to your nature. You, you enjoy filling in all these gaps, don't you, that the original production teams just sort of left. It's as if they were waiting for you to come along. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, um, there are, because sometimes there are these small gaps are, are chasms. Uh, Roger Delgado never appearing in, at the end of Pertwee's era seems like a, and will always be sadly on screen, a loss, an absence. Um, on a much it's a, glare, a glaring one, isn't it? And that was unfinished yeah. business. But yes. th this is a lot less so, isn't it? It is. It is a lot less so. But the more that I learned about that, I've learned about Peter Butterworth as a man. Um, the more I feel that it was a shame, at the least, that uh, the production team never brought him back. The, the television series, his appearances make it unfinished business because had he appeared only, like you see in this image here, in the Time Middler. Mm -hmm. That would be the perfect yeah. way to bring him back. He would be trapped on Earth and, oh, that you could find him. But because he shows up again in the Dalek's master plan, and the last thing you see of him is entering his TARDIS, and the shot doesn't even completely show him enter the TARDIS. He's just like halfway into the door, and that's it. It feels like, well, will we see him again? No, we don't, ever. We still have not, 50, uh, 58 years later. So uh, it, it is unfinished business, and I... I I once I discovered that there was a character, the monk, and I discovered his two television stories. Something inside me, probably because I love trilogies, I feel compelled to get a third appearance. Maybe say we have to, I have to write a story that brings the monk back to meet with the first doctor at least one more time. And so the monk specifically was your starting point to creating this story. <laughs> Absolutely, um, I suppose the the real genesis was. Uh, I, I got my hands on a copy of the BBC PDA, Past Doctor Venture Bunker Soldiers by um, Martin Day. It has nothing to do with the monk, but it is a story with the first Doctor, Stephen and Dodo. And they are um, they are trapped inside the besieged city of Kiev um, in the 14th century when the Mongols are attacking. And the, the Doctor mentions to Stephen just in passing twice in the book, the monk. Yeah. He says, oh, the monk is, this would be an interesting situation for him. And I thought, it struck a chord in me just the thought of they're mentioning a character beyond the span of his time on screen. Uh, hmm. Slightly later, it's set, but you know, uh, you know, after you would see the monk on screen. So I thought, oh well, he's still around, and and, and that kind of resonated with me the idea that he could come back. He, it's not like he's confined to those two stories. The story of the misshapen planet begins with the TARDIS intercepting a distress call doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Base, isn't it? A tried and tested method for embarking on it, on an adventure story in outer space. But this being Doctor Who, it's quite idiosyncratic, isn't it, from the from the outset? Oh, well, yes. I mean, I, I, I thought to myself, if the TARDIS is going to intercept a distress signal, well, what would what, what will start the story? I thought, well, the distress signal is tried and true, but I thought if I'm doing a something that's tried and true, what will make it unique and the unique element was that um, when they track down the signal, only the doctor can hear it. And so I, and that gives that sense of immediate danger. And so I, that came, that gave me the title, the silent signal. And it, it just gave me a sense of doing something slightly different. The TARDIS is so un unpredictable, unstable. It's okay, it's traveling through time. So we can follow the signal. And so that was a lot of fun to begin the idea, yeah. You see, for me, when I think back to this era, what I always, what I'm always struck by when I think about it, and when I watch it, come to think of it, Lee, is the intimacy of the first Doctor's era. Not just in in the way that the series was produced. Then, you know, we've all heard the legends of me about the size of the studios and all the rest of it. But how how contained the performances <laughs> often were. Not least of all that of of William Hartnell, the first Doctor. So you've got all all those elements in there. It all combines to create a very precise air and ambience around it doesn't it but from your perspective you've got you've got words written by chris mckeon you've got performances by a, a set of actors looking to recreate the dynamics of the the original talent peter purvis peter purvis and jackie lane as well as william hartnell but you've still got to yes. convince the listener <laughs> these characters we well, used to you have still this is where you come into it, isn't it you've got to convince the listener to to assure them that they are where Chris 
says they are, haven't you? That all comes down to you through ordered audio visual to, cr- to evoke a time and create soundscapes. So when you got hold of this material, was it a case of, oh, where do I start? Or did you think, oh, yes, at last, and you just dived right in? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, um, my first port of call was the original production, which uh, was uh, produced and put on online in its first three parts, uh, which were very, very compelling for me. It was a source material. Um, but I, I, I kind of wanted to do it in my own way the original version was 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 really really great but it, it i wanted to make it, it was very uh, surreal in the many ways it had this kind of very sort of very 60s science fiction thing which is very you know attuned to the time that it was set in but um i wanted to kind of make it a mix of sort of the 1960s but dare i say it, for the modern audience not not in the current day uh, <laughs> version of the meaning of the word but uh, what i what i started with was obviously the excellent excellent performances which i was lucky enough to receive i, I was lucky enough to be introduced to sean and uh, speak to him and i i was listening to the original version and i thought i want something slightly different i wanted a slightly different punchier faster paced more irritated doctor <laughs> so i got sean to re-record <laughs> everything <laughs> and i i i put my director's hat on for that one and i i got him to give me his absolute 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 best and stitching that together was an absolute joy it was a pain in the ass but it was an absolute joy at the same time um and what because i've never mixed um an audio drama before ever so this was a first for me wow. and um I, I i didn't really know where to begin or where to start so i just started laying out the tracks um and sort of doing everything on the fly and adding effects as i was on the on the go and editing and chopping up and and, and seeing how it sounded because if i was doing the effects in real time i could get a better sense of uh, place and i i used um for the first time as well <laughs> Uh, so this is all the first for me as well. It, it was the using Dolby Atmos, which is like a 3D sound kind of thing. You can put sounds in the 3D space, you know, up above you, oh, okay. you know, yeah. over to the left and behind you, that kind of stuff um, through headphones with binaural mixing. So I'd never, I only sort of experimented with it a little bit prior and um, with music, but not with... Mm-hmm audio drama so this was a big first for me <laughs> and uh, i i was absolutely flummoxed a lot of the time and it took me a long time to kind of get to grips with it but uh, i think i got there in the, <laughs> in the end um it's not exactly 1960s dot two it's a bit more orchestral um so i don't know I'm, I, i'll see uh if the second episode i want to kind of keep it in you know in uh true to to the first episode so i, I can't sort of wander too far off from that well, point now to my untrained ear <laughs> it sounds like you fit a very precise balance very very well and as part of this edition of type 40 extra i, I don't want to keep teasing people indefinitely and not throwing something at them out there for them to sample so here's a an official teaser here from your youtube channel here it is
Black Glove Studio presents Doctor Who, The Misshapen Planet, Part 1, coming soon. Absolutely chilling, particularly the, geezer, particularly the geezer at the end there. Uh, really got the <laughs> <laughs> no, really though, this is so evocative, and it reminds me not just of classic Doctor Who, but of a lot of classic science fiction of that time from literally all over the world. Episodes of the Twilight Zone, the Outer Limits, all that kind of thing. It's it's very very unsettling. For contact, Chris. How did you guys come to connect to work on this project in the first place? Because as I said earlier on, I've known you both for several years. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that I didn't have the idea to put you guys together. <laughs> you, found, you found one another anyway, very fortunately. But how did that come into it? We heard how Sean got involved. How did how did you find Chris, and how did Chris find you? I released the final game, and then a lot of people noticed. And uh, and Lee was kind enough to um, comment a few times on our then Twitter page, now X, just saying, oh, the Black Ops 2 is really good stuff. People should listen. And, um, and when... don't forget, we did, we did the, um, yes, we yes. did a read through of the, uh, um, uh, one of your, one of your audio stories, but we know. Yes. Well, yes. Thank you for reminding me. Yes. And then, um, you reached out cause I was reaching out to people saying, Hey, we need actors mm. to do things. And Lee was kind enough to volunteer to play the trickster in, um, in the still ongoing, it's not shelved, but the still ongoing <laughs> project of um, the Sarah Jane Adventures Series 5, Volume 2, um, which is just, I, I wrote the scripts to um, the meticulous research, I'll just say this, to the three unmade stories, the final three stories of Series 5 of the Sarah Jane Adventures, unmade because of the death of Liz Sladen. Uh, and, of course, the trickster we know was supposed to come back in that last story. So Lee volunteered to be the... Uh, the trickster for that adventure. And so we had a wonderful read through still one of my the highlights of COVID lockdown times. It was probably around July or so of 2020. And uh, in terms of this adventure, the misshapen planet, I just threw it out there to, to Twitter uh, saying, can anyone else would like, would like to take part in kind of remastering <clears throat> this or finishing the last story at the time, just doing part four and then Lee volunteered. Yes, yeah, so eventually you premiered this, didn't you, on Christmas Day as a big Christmas present for the Doctor Who fans. But how long had you been working on it for in the run-up to then? Too bloody long. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was um, I was working on this flat out because I, I had other sort of paid work as well and I had all sorts of other things to, to do. It was quite a trial and error situation and I had... Also, then I bought a new computer, then I had to transfer things. Oh, God, so it went on for about <laughs> a good year and a bit, I guess. <laughs> um, it was a case of, well, I'm not going to miss the 60th anniversary um, or, or let it go. So I had to, to really just kind of put my uh, editor's hat on and say, no, that's good. It's done. It needs to go. Put the first episode out then um, see how the uh, reaction is to it. And uh, from there on, you know, it's just a case of, well, I've, I've just got to plow through it and get the second episode out when I can. Um, so it, it's it's not how I wanted it to be, not how I envisioned it to be. I really wanted it to be all sort of done and dusted before the first episode went out. But as I say, it, it's super, super hard work. It's just me. Yeah. Well, because Chris's stories as well are so... I mean, I've got nothing. Very layered. Against, yeah. Exactly. I've got nothing against fan fiction whatsoever. And whilst I know that this isn't licensed, Chris, I never think of your stuff as being fan fiction because oh. there is so much substance to it. If I surrender to the fanish instincts, meaning and, and might as well say what fanish stuff means, it just simply means putting putting my desires as a fan ahead of the my my control as a, as an author. Uh, and saying, well, can't we do this? Can't we do that? Then that starts to clutter the narrative space and you get distracted. And then it becomes no longer a story, but an exercise in really almost um, showing off, saying, well, see, see how much yeah. I know and, 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 and see this. See this. It's, it's if, if a story is a tour of your house or a room in your house and you, have, you can have infinite rooms in the house, you want to present the room in its best possible way and say, this is, this, this is the blue room. This is the red room. This is the green, whatever. But if you... 
if you have, therefore, let's say this misshapen plant is the blue root, you want to show things that um, demonstrate blue or whatever blue means, meaning this, the theme and the tone and the shape of your story. But if you have a lot of red stuff in that blue room or a lot of uh, green stuff or a lot of yellow stuff, and it's like, because I really like yellow and I really wanted yellow to be in the story just because I love the color yellow, it, it really clashes and distracts from the, from the story itself. I restrain myself to at least really just one book reference, one comic reference, one audio reference in the for example, in the case of part one of this story, the audio reference is when, uh, and Sean will know this, when he when he lists the pl uh, the places that the Vord have invaded, he says Hydra. Well, that's a reference to the Big Finish audio domain of the Vord. Earlier on, we talked about about the monk, mm -hmm. who is a bit of a fan, a low, lower level fan favorite character, I, I think. We, we were all resigned to the fact there were only two monk stories and, and that we couldn't see most of the of one of them. It's one of those things we've had to live with for decades and decades. But the presence of the Vord, they're very particular characters. And like a lot of villains from a lot of 60s material, they, they make one feel a certain way. They're a very unsettling presence. So when you chose them to use in this audio drama, were they, was that part of you that said, you know, if I think back to that time, if there's one villain, if there was one monster race that I felt never had a fair crack of the whip or could have come back for a further appearance, it should be the Vord, or were, was this the needs of the script? Because I haven't heard the remaining parts. I don't know where this story goes. Mm -hmm. Was the Vord the most natural fit? Um, what was, in a way, what was meant to be a fit always was that the 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 Hartnell's Doctor was, was meant to uh, meet an old foe beyond the monk. You'd have the monk, you'd have his companions, and then you'd have a, a kind of a, a monster of that era. But I <coughs> then comes the then comes the, the limits of the creativity. My first thought was, well, should I have the Daleks again? I thought, well, no, we know that Dodo, well, at least we thought we did. Um, but on screen in the war machines, Dodo doesn't know who the Daleks are. And the doctor tells her, oh, yes, you never met them, and I hope you never will. So I thought, okay, we can't have the Daleks. And I probably might not have used them anyway, but I thought, I want a monster. I thought, should I use the Cybermen? I thought, no, I, I think I'll save them, Leave, let the television series as it is. Then it became almost out of necessity. Well, there are the Vord, because they are this very strange, very enigmatic, yet very recognizable in their simplicity, except they for their helmets. They are so recognizable. Yeah, yeah and I, I just thought there's... And then I thought, I did my research, and I thought, well, have we seen the Vord since? Now, remember, I first wrote this story as a little pro short story in 2010. That's before Big Finish ever touched the board, and that's pretty much before anyone touched the board except for Keys <laughs> of Marinus. But they're only cameo appearance monsters even then. They only show up in part one and six they of spend that a lot story. Of time skulking, skulking around, don't they? They're skulking around. They have almost no dialogue. Uh, because it's black and white and they're in black suits, they're actually quite difficult to see. And so the, the, they are really, and even now, but certainly then, you know, actually now quite a number of years ago, they're largely blank canvas. It was before Big Finish used them in Domain of the Vord. So I, I just realized I had a very special canvas to use. I had almost nothing except that story and the Fishmen of Candelinga, um, which I didn't want to reference much because, you know, it's, it's quite obscure. But it gave me one wonderful thing to, as a jumping point was that the Vord are telepathic. Um, so I, that was my fan element too, which is what can I use? Oh, they're telepathic. How do they, how do they broadcast it? Then the antenna on their heads. So using that as a springboard and then building from there. And it was a wonderful experience, but yeah, I, I needed just summarizing. I needed something, something was always going to be there. That was a villain. But if you take away the Daleks as a, as a resource, as a, then you really are limited in the Hartnell era. Uh, Sean, yeah. when it comes to, when it comes to classic Doctor Who, is the yeah. First Doctor's era one that you're particularly fond of or familiar with? Or was some of this really deep for you? Did you, know, did you catch them all on UK Gold, for example? Or did you miss <laughs> some now and again? Or have you gone back to them over and over? Because Chris, you know, there's not many people that know this material in, to the depth that Chris does, are there? Yeah, I absolutely adore the Hartnell era. Um, yeah, and as I say, when I was recording... For this story, I was going back over the, you know, Dodo, Stephen, and First Doctor adventures over and over again, looking at clips, looking at the relationship between the characters, and yeah, um, I just 
I've I actually when I was younger and I still do now because I was brought up with like Laurel and Hardy and James Cagney films and Humphrey Bogart. Really, I, I actually preferred the Hartnell era over the Pertwee era, which is predominantly in colour, isn't it? And um, you'd think a, a young person wouldn't be into that, but I, I, I preferred the first Doctor over the the third, for example. Um, watching the era, um, I couldn't just think of, uh, you know, the lines that are said. I had to think of, so what was he like on set on the day? Was he tired? Was he irritable? And things like that, and. Um, all all these things just came together to hopefully inform the performance. Um, but I absolutely adore the Heart and Lyra, and every time we get um, you know news of a lost story animated, it's like another little piece of the puzzle. Really, what was uh, the biggest challenge for you, Sean? When you analyse the whole of his era, you do see a progression, and the fact that I had to tap into his performance so for um across the era so he's he's very sp- specific in um go on i beg your pardon young man <laughs> what did you say <laughs> do it do what sir mm. i'm not a performing monkey oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, Johnny in the cast to this, we've got uh, Zoe Jenkins playing Dodo. Christopher Kovalenko plays Stephen, and the monk is played by Peter Lutz. So it's a, a compact cast there for you to work alongside. Did you record all of your parts independently, Sean, or did you yeah. were you able to work with some of these other actors? Yeah, unfortunately, I was doing it independently, which is common, isn't it? And it's just a shame that I wasn't able to bounce off these great actors and develop a rapport really um, yeah. you'd, ne- you'd never know it from listening to the, the piece which I suppose is partly again it's it's your acting combined with that with the words on the page and Lee's incredible work of making it seem like you're all in the same place at the same time yeah a lot of it's in the editing but without the fantastic performances which are professional standard through and through and what i love about zoe's performance particularly is it's just got that very clipped nuanced uh bbc crisp <laughs> accent because because uh, that's the thing with D- dodo's character isn't it you've got two different sort of versions of her one where she's got the the very crisp clear received pronunciation uh and then you've got the northern dodo which came <laughs> a bit later so i i, I quite like yeah. the fact that she's got that very sort of yeah, the 1960s RP accent, uh, and it, it's got that real charm to it, which is quite, quite uh, lovely to work with. The the Stephen performance is, is it's so uncanny uh, and wonderful, and he's got this very sort of deep resonance, and it's a beautiful voice to work with. And he, he, he that, and that's the, <laughs> that's the thing, when you get these different files of uh, dialogue, or monologues, really, um, they're all different, you know. Sometimes um, with uh, with the monk, it's you know the you get the lines repeated a couple of times, and then move on to the next few lines repeated a couple of times. Stevens like he does three or four in a row of certain sentences of dialogue, and then uh, with Sean, I get reams and reams, I get gigabytes of. <laughs> you would not believe it's my fault because I I, ta- I told him to to re-record loads of things and uh, it, my god the, the guy is so committed I, I I'm surprised there's enough bandwidth in the world to be able to download it all. and I've got to go through each individual line each individual individual iteration of that line because they might be, you know do it slightly differently and I have to choose which one I think works with the previous line um and then there might be the odd fluff line and 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 with sean's performances there are a couple of times when he did fluff a line and i kept it in deliberately because i thought well what is more hartnell <laughs> than, than having the odd fluff line and, and i push a pull you know that, that kind of thing um yeah, yeah. and i i love that and so when i do come across those if it if it does kind of work for hartnell i'll keep them in people can listen to 
episode one of the misshapen planet the silent signal right now can't they so where can they hear this it's on my channel uh, at the moment um we might down the line release the full version on chris's channel i don't know if he's got one set up yet but we'll see um and it's at Audred um or, or Audred audio Vision. but if you type in at Audred, it will take you straight there and it is the, uh, the 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 featured the featured episode is is the first one right now. So, so obviously, the links will be in the description to this video, of course. Too. Now you're hunkering down, aren't you, to work together on episode two? So, given the fact that you've you've learned so much working on episode one over over all these months, is that making episode two uh, a, a, a faster? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. It does. You've established yeah. certain parameters, haven't you, and a sound to the, and a general sound to the production. So now you can sort of play with play within that. That's right, because um, now I've got the sort of the main environments. You know, the inside of the TARDIS is the inside of the dirigible, um, and all the effects that are on the voices. Like, for example, of the the Pardock, which is the the, the Vord leader, the commander. His voice is a semi pitch or to three lower than his normal voice. So that's all pre programmed in now. You've got all the effects and all the things, and I've got folders and folders of music and sound effects and all sorts of things. So I can just sort of drop in. So I can take a scene that I've used before, like an environ, and just drop in the new dialogue in there. So it's, it saves an awful lot of time. So I've got a workflow now. So hopefully, episode two won't take so long to produce. <laughs> I cannot wait to hear what happens next. I've listened to this thing three times already. Hey. Oh, no, nice. Now, I've been, for the last few years, I say, Chris, I can't remember how many times we've spoken now. It's yes. At least half a dozen. And we speak, obviously, when we're not recording as well, you and I speak quite frequently. And mm -hmm. you've got several balls in the air at any mm -hmm. given time. Several. God, that sounded really bad. You, <laughs> you've got several productions in various uh, stages, haven't you, of the creative process. You're always flitting from, from one to the other. And yes. I've always appreciated, enjoyed, whichever it is that, that you spring on us next, I've always enjoyed your work. But in yes. my view, this, this episode of The New Misshapen Planet is several levels above anything that you've ever achieved. Oh, wow. Thank, thank you so much. It's, it's, it's so really... tight, so evocative. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know how well it's been received out there, but what's been the feedback so far? So far, very positive. I mean, it's, it's, um, it, yeah, I, I hope that people continue to watch. I hope that's a slow burn in this, at the least in the sense of people discovering it because it's not, it's not a, it's not a lost story like, um, like the final game. It's that would have been there, but it's my own original creation. But generally speaking, whatever you're working on, you like to get better at whatever it is that you're you're doing, whichever craft. Yes, there is room for growth certainly, and so I, uh, I'm very grateful to Lee. He's an, an emblematic of this growth of the process. Someone that knows what, he, like Gareth did, of course, but a, a different style that uh, that makes this uh, very streamlined and very beautiful, and uh, something very. The, everyone involved should be very, uh, in my opinion, very uh, proud to have been involved. It's a small way of saying thank you so much for beginning this wonderful 60-year um, journey that we've had together as fans for Doctor Who. So I'm grateful to to return a little bit uh, of, of gratitude towards the, uh, the Hartnell era. I've always been a big fan of what well, Peter Butterworth generally come to think of it. You know, I grew up on the Carry On movies. Mm, yes. <laughs> I don't know how many he did. He probably didn't do as many as I think he did, Lee, but in my head, he was in all of them, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm with you. He's, he's, he's such a, a wonderful character actor. He was always hilarious, to my opinion. You know, I, I always loved his performances in Carry On movies. And, you know, it, it took me many years, you know, to even realise it was the same person as the monk. I, when I was younger, I, had, I didn't connect the two. It's really weird. <laughs> so I've always wanted to see and hear more of this character. And so any sort of any comic strip, any audio, any, any project with the monk in, I, I lap it up. And, uh, and yeah, this, and I think that's one of the reasons why I enjoyed this so much as well. A story that fans perhaps didn't know that they that they wanted. And whilst they can feast on episode one right now there on YouTube, link in the description, episode two is on the way. And we are very, very honoured to be able to bring you an exclusive clip 
of a it's a sort of rough cut isn't it lee of yeah excerpt of episode two so do you want to do you want to give us an introduction of what what this is so this is where um we get the tardis team the first doctor and the, and his team meet the monk uh for the first time since the last time although dodo hasn't met him yet and uh yes so this is awkward <laughs> <laughs> okay Straight over to this exclusive excerpt from episode two of The Misshapen Planet, coming soon-ish. It's the TARDIS. Are you certain, my dear? Hmm? <laughs> Oi, wait a moment. The room is grey. The round things in the walls are silver, not white. And there's a door where the computer should be. Stephen! It isn't the same. Yes, you're right. It almost looks like... <sighs> oh, no. Yes, I'm afraid your realization is correct, my boy. This is not our ship. Not my TARDIS. <laughs> What's going on, Doctor? If this isn't our TARDIS, then whose is it? Oh, who's indeed, young Dodo, yes. This is the prime question to pose. And I know the one person to ask who can provide the answer. <laughs> Shh. Oh, the cruelty of it all. There's no justice in the cosmos. None. <laughs> Doctor? Doctor! And my dear friend Stephen Taylor, <laughs> oh my goodness, how blessed it is to see familiar and friendly faces here in this uncharitable place. <laughs> familiar I may be, sir, but friendly I refuse to be with you. Huh. Stephen, why do you think the Doctor's so spiky? For the same reason I am, Dodo. And that's it, yeah. Episode two of the Misshapen Planet. They're coming whenever to YouTube. Make sure you will follow the link in the description and subscribe to the YouTube channel Audrid Audio Visual. And make sure you hit that bell to get all the notifications. You'll be notified when episode two materializes. Yes, and uh, if people want to leave you more fabulous comments about this incredible audio production they can do so can't they guys by by dropping in a comment or contacting you through social media so where would you advise where's the best place that they can reach you chris uh, i'm most active on on x uh and the our handle is at studio glove a capital s capital g um we also have a facebook page is black Love studio and instagram black Love studio um but uh I'm most directly uh, available uh, there at uh, at uh, um, at Studio Glove uh, Channel on X, yeah. And you have several projects, don't you? Various yes. stages of production. What are you looking for at the moment? Give them a quick blast. Give a few bullet points. I'm looking for this person, that person, this person, and that person. I am very much looking for uh, at least one person who can do um, uh, digital facial sculpting. Um, Akin to deep fakes and such, but uh, that can you know you can build uh, faces and animate them through something like the Unreal Five engine for my wedding of Sarah J. Smith project with the Brigadier, um, featuring the Brigadier scene. So you get to meet, so that uh, the Brigadier will be able to meet the Doctor, the Tenth Doctor, is played by David Tennant. Um, I'm very much looking for uh, anyone that has 3D animation skills and uh, 2D animation um, skills uh, for our big project, which is the. Uh, the uh, animation, we'll call it Restored Season 23 animation project. That's Colin Baker's missing original Season 23 season with stories like The Nightmare Fair and such, where he would have met the toy maker on screen. Uh, we are deep into pre-production of The Nightmare Fair. So, but we, but the more the merrier. Anyone that can help us on the 3D side, um, building the sets and the backgrounds, and the 2D side drawing the characters are very much appreciated. And um, and I will sh assuring listeners that uh, the Sarah Jane Adventures series five volume two <laughs> is coming um, eventually. That's a it's, it's a ways off because of just the size of the project. Uh, but oh. yeah, thanks for coming on, Sean. It's it's been uh, good to have you on and and yeah, yeah to disclose you, some more another corner of this fabulous production. It's always appreciated because I do feel when we've got these we've got these things that come together. 
they appear. You know, good people, talented people, pull resources, and they appear for the rest of us magically on various platforms, and we consume them. And mm. um, I don't know. I think a lot of us do stop and think, I wonder how they did this. I wonder how they did that. And it's one thing to speak to one person, but sincerely, to, to speak to two or three people from different corners of the same project, it really does bring bring it all to life and, and sort of stitch it all together in the same way that I think Chris has so much fun doing there doing there on the page. Uh, Lee, it's always a joy to have you on the on the show. Uh, you know you have my undying gratitude for the greatest theme tune in the history of Doctor Who podcast. <laughs> But <laughs> apart from, it's never going to get old. I'm never going to stop saying it. Um, but apart from that, people can find you across social media, can't they? They, they can engage with you, follow your projects, and you, they can commission you too, can't they, for various creative works? They can. I mean, uh, really best just to come to uh, the YouTube channel, Aldred, uh, Aldred uh, leave me a comment and uh, I can get in touch with you. Um, I would say we really would love more people to leave comments. It's wonderful, the comments that we have, but to help the algorithm for YouTube, it would be wonderful if we could get okay. some more comments. That'd be great. And, and spread it around, please. We want, uh, we want as many people to hear it as possible. Absolutely. Spread the love, leave a comment. I'm gonna go and leave one right now everybody oh, i think but that's after i remind you that if you want to get in touch with me you can do so through social media instagram and x at type 40 doctor who i think we've probably given you all the links they'll certainly be in the description to this video anyway but if there's any way that we can help put you in touch with the guys if, if you want to get involved with any of chris's projects maybe or any comments about the misshape and planet and we can we can pass them on too but failing that yeah get yourself a google account Make sure you go in, log in, and leave them a comment. And let's let's boost the misshapen planet. Let's get the silent signal a little bit louder. I think that would be absolutely ideal. Okay, yes, you can drop us a comment too here at the Type 40 channel. And we'll be back in the not-too-distant future with more tales from the fabulous world of fan productions. If you're involved in fan productions or fan art or cosplay or any other fandom endeavour, we'd love to hear from you. But that's it for this time. Gentlemen, thank you all for your company. Uh, thank you. Thank everybody you. at Type 40 wishes you the best with this production. Can't wait to hear it all in full. I know it'll be worth the wait, Lee. I, I've no doubt whatsoever. And Chris, you're always welcome right. to come back and talk about which, whichever project you've got on the starting grid next. We'll see you in the comments section. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>